Chapter 4 Common Descent Fact or Theory The phrase tree of life, claiming that all organisms are related, occurs only once in the origin of species. Darwin illustrated a part of that tree in the book's single diagram. The best-known depiction of the tree of life was published by the German physiologist Ernst Haeckel in 1879. It was titled The Pedigree of Man. Universal common descent is another way of making the same claim, the claim that all organisms are cousins, however distant their cousinship may be. Common ancestry is a deduction from universal common descent. If common descent is true, then any two species must have a common ancestor, no matter how dissimilar they may appear to be. Branches must meet somewhere if the tree is real. Twigs can't just hang in midair. Cats and dogs, for example, both belong to the order Carnivora. They may have a common ancestor about 60 million years ago. Chimpanzees and humans are assumed to have shared a more recent common ancestor, perhaps 6 million years ago. But we don't know what any of these ancestral creatures looked like. Richard Dawkins, as we shall see, discussed some of the difficulties in visualizing them. Notice that the claim of chimp-human common ancestry is not the same as saying that chimpanzees themselves are ancestral to humans. Biologists rarely claim that one species evolved into another. But if it's true that all organisms are cousins, what eventually became humans and chimps must at some earlier point have been united at a branching point. That theoretical creature is usually called an ape, or more technically, a non-human hominoid. The last common ancestor of chimps and humans was certainly not fossilized. And amazingly, the only known fossil of any chimpanzee was found only 12 years ago, in 2004. That fossil, which came in the form of teeth, was said to be alive half a million years ago. As an aside, chimpanzees played a role in Darwin's formulation of the origin of species. They were brought to London's zoological garden for the first time in the 1830s. Queen Victoria visited the zoo, but was not amused. She found the chimpanzees painfully and disagreeably human, but Darwin was impressed. Coming from a wealthy family, he was admitted into the cage of a chimp named Jenny, who was kept inside the heated giraffe house during the winter. When a keeper sternly addressed the chimp, Jenny, if you will stop bawling and be a good girl, I will give you the apple. Darwin felt sure that she understood every word. Today, common descent is mostly accepted as a fact within the academic world. Louis Pasteur is said to have called the claim that all life comes from other life the law of biogenesis. The immunologist Peter Medawar defined that law as the claim that all living organisms are the progeny of living organisms that went before them. Alternatively, if a creature were shown not to have parents, the theory of evolution would collapse. Medawar, 1915-1987, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1960, added this comment. The law of biogenesis is arguably the most fundamental in biology, for evolution may be construed as a form of biogenesis that provides for the occasional begetting of a variant form. Biogenesis is not fully law-like, however, because by definition, the first living organism was not the progeny of anything living. We may therefore ask, if a law has one exception, might it not have more than one? Biologists are not in total accord on the issue today. Some accept a single branching tree, Darwin style, the monophyletic position. Others think that different branches of life originated independently, the polyphyletic position. For them, the history of life resembles an orchard, not a single exfoliating tree. These orchard theorists, as they are called by some, may differ among themselves as to how many separate trees there are. For example, the late microbiologist Carl Woese, 1928-2012, argued that extant life on Earth is descended not from one, but from three distinctly different cell types. Those three types are found today 
in the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukaryotes. However, Wos added, the designs of the three have developed and matured in a communal fashion, along with those of many other designs that along the way became extinct. Other biologists, differing from Wos, think there may have been more than three original forms. For Darwinists, the monophyletic position is usually treated as a given. In fact, it is treated as a postulate. According to Casey Luskin, then with the Discovery Institute, the truth is that common ancestry is merely an assumption that governs interpretation of the data, not an undeniable conclusion. Whenever data contradicts expectations of common descent, evolutionists resort to a variety of ad hoc rationalizations to save common descent from being falsified. University of Tufts philosopher Daniel Dennett took the conventional position when he said that Darwin started out with facts that everyone knows, that all of today's living things are the offspring of parents, who are the offspring of grandparents, and so forth. Extrapolating from that, Darwin himself eventually decided that there is a single tree of life. Theistic evolutionists, whose position is epitomized by Biologos, founded in 2006 by Francis S. Collins, who later became the director of the National Institutes of Health, believe that the diversity and interrelation of all life on Earth are best explained by the God-ordained process of evolution with common descent. Biologos, too, accepts a single tree of life. Turnips, our cousins. Richard Dawkins once said that we are distant cousins of turnips. In 2004, he wrote an article for the London Sunday Times with Richard Herries, then the Bishop of Oxford, who accepted that evolution is a fact. Others, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, were only too happy to agree. We may recall that Samuel Wilberforce, the earlier and rather more skeptical Bishop of Oxford, he debated T. H. Huxley in 1860, dryly referred to our unsuspected cousinship with the mushrooms. In any event, our alleged cousinship, whether with turnips or mushrooms, has certainly not been observed. Since we are unable to go back in time, it's hard to know what could confirm such a claim. But we should retain the skepticism that is appropriate to science and inquire further. Can we really know how many times life appeared from non-life? If once, maybe it did so often. Early on, Darwin himself raised that as a possibility. He ended the origin of species with the comment that there was a grandeur in his view of life, which he believed was originally breathed into a few forms or into one. A few forms. Here Darwin was candid enough to admit that he didn't know how often life had arisen from non-life we still don't know today. In a letter to Joseph Hooker in 1871, Darwin speculated that a warm little pond might have been the source of life. His comment serves to remind us that observation often plays little or no role in these ruminations. Here it is important to add a caution. The theory of common descent is not the same as Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwinism is the more severe doctrine, admitting only material causes. Its goal is to explain the whole of nature within a purely naturalistic framework, with natural selection doing all the work. Common descent, on the other hand, can embrace design and or supernatural intervention and still remain true. All organisms, save the first, could and perhaps did have parents. At the same time, speciation events in the history of life could have been guided by interventions from a source that is external to nature. Some advocates of intelligent design today accept common descent. The best known is Michael Behe. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, he was the first to set forth the idea of irreducible complexity. On the other hand, William Dembski, a leader of the intelligent design movement, mildly disagreed with Behe. Common descent seems to me not all that well established, he said in a brief interview. Certain fossils and molecular evidence suggest that a fair amount of evolution may have taken place, perhaps to the level of families, orders, or even classes. But the grand picture of evolution, monad to man, as Michael Ruse calls it, seems to me unsupported. 
Indeed, the evidence seems to be against it. Others who are critical of Darwinism, but not committed to ID, do accept common dissent. For example, James A. Barham, an independent researcher, told me that he prefers to assume a god who created a natural order that is capable of producing whatever exists under its own steam without his further intervention. At least, that seems to me the best working assumption, because it forces us to continue to try to think beyond the boundaries of our current understanding. He argued not that God worked a series of miracles, but that the natural order must somehow contain within it the possibility for our existence. Our job is to investigate the natural order further so that we may understand how this has been possible. What is the best evidence for common descent? In his 2009 book, The Greatest Show on Earth, Dawkins addressed the question and made a genetic argument. Today we are pretty certain that all living creatures on this planet are descended from a single ancestor. The evidence is that the genetic code is universal, all but identical across animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, archaea, and viruses. The 64-word dictionary by which the three-letter DNA words are translated into 20 amino acids and one punctuation mark, which means start reading here or stop reading here, is the same 64-word dictionary wherever you look in the living kingdoms, with one or two exceptions too minor to undermine the generalization. Dawkins went on to say that if some weird anomalous microbes called the harem scariotes were discovered, which used a triplet code, but not the same 64-word dictionary. If any of these conditions were met, we might suggest that life had originated twice, once for the harem scariotes and once the rest of life. He then added a related reason for believing that the genetic code must be universal. The reason is interesting. Any mutation in the genetic code itself, as opposed to mutations in the genes that it encodes, would have an instantly catastrophic effect, not just in one place, but throughout the whole organism. If any word in the 64-word dictionary changed its meaning so that it came to specify a different amino acid, just about every protein in the body would instantaneously change, probably in many places along its length. Unlike an ordinary mutation, this would spell disaster. We might compare Dawkins's disaster to an error on a computer keyboard which shifts all letters one position to the left, unbeknownst to the user. This could well render all typed words unintelligible. A simple typo, on the other hand, would introduce an error only into a single word. Dawkins's argument about the universality of the genetic code seemed impressive at first, but there was a problem. He had accepted one or two exceptions to its universality, but he thought they were minor. Since that time, however, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, a government agency, has compiled a list of 17 known variant genetic codes. When it came to the genetic code then, the exceptions were not minor. Dawkins had not kept up with the latest evidence. Harvard's Ernst Mayer made the same mistake. He wrote in 1986, Was Darwin right about common descent? Certainly. The last link in the chain of evidence was the demonstration by molecular biology that all organisms have the same genetic code. There is a historical unity in the entire living world which cannot help but have a deep meaning for any thinking person. In one long argument, 1993, Mayer doubled down, writing that common descent has been gloriously confirmed by all researches since 1859. Everything we have learned about the physiology and chemistry of organisms since then supports Darwin's daring speculation, he wrote. But J. Craig Venter, a biochemist who was one of the first to sequence the human genome, is among those who have challenged this claim. He forthrightly denied that the genetic code is universal. The bacterium mycoplasma has a non-universal code, he pointed out. He also said he found it implausible that all organisms on Earth share a common ancestor. This was publicized in a science forum held at Arizona State University in February 2011, a little over a year after Dawkins's greatest show was published. 
The physicist Paul Davies and others, including two Nobel Prize winners, participated in the event, which was videotaped. Richard Dawkins himself was on the panel. The forum addressed the question, what is life? Most of the panelists accepted that all organisms on Earth represent a single kind of life because they believed that the genetic code is universal. The NASA scientist and panelist Chris McKay made the case that this single form of life, a sample of one, should encourage us to further explore Mars and other planets for signs of life. Craig Venter then disputed the premise. He challenged the claim that there's only one life form on this planet. We have a lot of different types of metabolism, different organisms, he said. He turned to Paul Davies and added, I wouldn't call you the same life form as the one we have that lives in pH 12 base. That would dissolve your skin if we dropped you in it. Well, I've got the same genetic code, said Davies. We'll have a common ancestor. You don't have the same genetic code, replied Venter. In fact, the mycoplasmas use a different genetic code that would not work in your cells. So there are a lot of variations on the theme. At that point, Paul Davies interrupted Venter. But you're not saying mycoplasma belongs to a different tree of life from me, are you? The tree of life is an artifact of some early scientific studies that aren't really holding up, Venter replied. So there is not a tree of life. The moderator then turned the microphone over to Richard Dawkins to see what he had to say. I'm intrigued at Craig saying that the tree of life is a fiction, Dawkins responded. The DNA code of all creatures that have ever been looked at is all but identical. But Venter had just denied that, telling the forum that his experimental bacteria read their DNA using a different coding convention. Dawkins began to show his own uncertainty. Surely that means that they're all related, he asked Venter, doesn't it? Casey Luskin, who has studied the videotape, available online, commented that, as nearly as we can tell from the video, Venter only smiles. Earlier, the evolutionary bioinformatics specialist W. Ford Doolittle had said in Science that the history of life cannot properly be represented as a tree. What do common ancestors look like? If the ancestors of separate organisms are conjoined at branching points, what do those common ancestors look like? Are we able to identify them in particular cases? And how do they compare with their descendants? In The Greatest Show, Dawkins candidly set forth some of the difficulties. He considered, for example, the postulated common ancestor of a herring, a vertebrate, and a squid, a mollusk. It is possible that one of them resembles the common ancestor more than the other, but it doesn't follow that this has to be the case. There has been an exactly equal amount of time for both to have diverged from the ancestor, so the prior expectation of an evolutionist might be, if anything, that no modern animal should be more primitive than another. Primitive has various meanings in biology, but Dawkins clarified that it means resembling ancestors. We might expect both of them to have changed to some extent, but in different directions since the time of the shared ancestor. Moreover, the different parts of animals don't all have to evolve at the same rate. Dawkins also discussed the common ancestor of monkeys and earthworms. Probably it would look more like an earthworm than a monkey, he allowed. But again, we don't really know, because both branches have had so much time to diverge. In the case of chimpanzees and humans, he thought it a fair bet that the common ancestor we share with them was more like a chimp than like us. It probably didn't walk upright as we do. It probably was a lot hairier than we are, and so on. But this should remind us that neither Dawkins nor anyone else knows what common ancestors look like. In fact, their very existence is a deduction from the tree of life. In the second edition of The Origin, 1860, Darwin laid down the law, forgetting about his earlier a few forms or one. All the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form. Nonetheless, Darwin's tree, and with it common descent, is still hypothetical. Craig Venter said it is an artifact, 
And as we have seen, the genetic code is not universal. So the question persists. Have common ancestors ever been identified? Transformed Cladists I once toured the exhibits at the Natural History Museum in London with Colin Patterson, then the senior paleontologist at the museum. That was in 1984. He told me that he was looking for cases where the actual common ancestor of two given species was identified in the diagrams on display. These would be at the nodes in the Tree of Life. But all the nodes shown in the museum were vacant, comparable to the branching points on roads, all of which are unidentified. Patterson told me that as far as he could see, nodes are always empty in diagrams of the Tree of Life. He also doubted we would ever have access to a Tree of Life that we could regard as factual. His text for an earlier exhibit of the Natural History Museum began, if the theory of evolution is true, it attracted a huge amount of attention from nature and other publications, most of it hostile. Patterson was a key figure in a group of taxonomists, or systematists, known as cladists. In fact, he became the unofficial leader of a more radical group called transformed cladists. They insisted that the morphology and structure of living organisms and their fossils are all that we know. Lacking birth records or death certificates, our ideas about ancestry can best be determined by the most parsimonious arrangement of the known traits of organisms. As to fossils, we sometimes do see exceptionally well-preserved examples, and they are well publicized. But usually, Patterson told me, a fossil is little more than a mess on a rock, telling us very little. Patterson was joined in his descent by a few paleontologists at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, notably Gareth Nelson, who for a time was chairman of the ichthyology department, and Norman Platnick, one of the world's experts on spiders. We shall return to cladistics, to Patterson, and to his supporters and critics in a later chapter. These dissenters are important because they laid down an important challenge to Darwinism and did so from within the academic establishment. Meanwhile, it seems fair to say that the verdict on common descent must be unproven. The evidence for it is weak. The genetic code is not universal. And even when the supporters of intelligent design accept common descent, as Michael Behe does, they add design requirements that put the claim of universal cousinship beyond the naturalistic domain. That is a forbidden move within present-day biology, which is dominated by a materialistic philosophy or methodological naturalism, as it is sometimes called. I devote Chapter 13 to a more detailed look at materialism.